Well, now we are here, why don't you tune up 1980 and we can... Well, leave. Nineteen eighty, Sarah, if you want to get off. Now, on BBC One, the latest action from Lake Placid in this afternoon's Olympic Grandstand. A Grieg and being shown for the first time on British television. It begins at 2.45. Well, just a reminder that all this week, children's programmes are being shown on BBC Two, and starting shortly is Go With Noakes, a six-part voyage of discovery around the coasts of Britain. Here on BBC One now, it's time for Olympic Grandstand. a humid Moscow evening and day two of the Olympic Games. And tonight, some of the world stars in our programme include athlete Sebastian Coe, the swimmer Duncan Goodhue, and gymnast Nelly Kim, and the reigning Olympic champion Nadia Komanech, who once again is in gold medal form. Chris Snowd, our double Commonwealth diving champion, competing this afternoon here in Moscow in the Olympic springboard event. Well, we'll be seeing his attempt to win a medal live from the diving pool in just a moment. Plus, Giron of Mexico, Alexander Portnoff of Russia was second, and Chris Snowed fifth. Peter Davison, who will shortly be taking over as the new Doctor Who, will be appearing in Pebble Minute One on December the 3rd. If you have any ideas about the character, clothes and companions the Time Lord should have following his transformation, please send them to Doctor Who, Pebble Minute One, BBC TV, Birmingham, by the 29th of November. Well, in 15 minutes, Larry Grayson invites more family couples to participate in the Generation Game. First on BBC One at 5 to 6, the news with Angela Rippon. As 82 people die in one of the worst hotel fires in America, there's growing criticism of the safety precautions at the Las Vegas Hotel. They're spending the day trying hard not to find out what they've been wanting to know for months. And we're not going to spoil the surprise. Americans already know who shot JR because last night they saw the long-awaited episode of Dallas, which reveals just that. And it was a relief for the actor who plays J.R. Ewing, Larry Hagman. He said, I'm sure as hell glad this thing is over. CBS television were expecting a record 80 million viewers for the crucial episode, and the US government was asked about the shooting. The question is, does the department have any information that would confirm who shot JR? <laughs> And the answer is that we have seen news reports concerning allegations about the various suspects. We have nothing official to report. And obviously, I can't be in a position of confirming anything. However, I would like to reiterate our long-standing policy against acts of terrorism. The attempted murder of Mr. Ewing only contributes to the continuing cycle of violence. And we will continue to monitor the situation. They all take it so seriously. The programme will be seen by some 250 million people around the world, and gamblers have been betting thousands of dollars, pounds, rands, francs, marks, and kroner on the identity of JR's would-be assassin. Well, viewers in Britain will know the answer in just under three hours. But that's it for now. The next news here on BBC One is at five to nine. Now uh, let's join Jim Bacon and look at the weather. Good evening. Well, we've still got some problems. This is BBC One North. Now look north Saturday. Thank you. 
Good evening. Uh, many of you will remember me. My name is Dr. Podger Smish of the Loyal Society for the Prevention of Mispronunciation. <laughs> for people who can't say their worms correctly. <laughs> I last spoke to you in the television uh, three or four queers ago. <laughs> I expect a number of you will dismember my face. <laughs> On that occlusion, I appeal to you from the bottom of my tart <laughs> to square a thought for those unfortunate inky diddlers, ordinary people like my elf who just can't steam to spray their worms correctly. <laughs> Now, on BBC One, we continue the early part of this Saturday evening in a traditionally light-hearted manner as... Larry and Rosalind, Colin and Diane, Val and Keith, Maureen and Ray are all here event. to... And that involved Bernard Levin. Disarray in the ranks of the unilateralists. One minute, Mr Levin, before you begin. It won't take a minute. Would you stand up a second? Mr Levin, your review of Savagery and the Light was not a review, Please, it I was a uh, vicious yes, attack it may well on an Would you mind going back? There's just one tiny thing to be done. So, the first question is, what was Bernard Levin's newspaper job at the time? It was the cause of the assault. Now, being upstaged by another person is one thing, but being upstaged by nature itself almost proved too much for David Attenborough. The volcanoes of today are mere feeble flicks. <laughs> that was from a programme which showed what went wrong during the filming of Life on Earth. So the second question is, in what country did that incident happen? The art of interviewing calls for intelligence, alertness and most important, a sense of balance, as this clip from a 1956 New York filming assignment shows. At the moment, I'm standing outside the living room of Mr. Hammerstein's house at 10 East 63rd Street, New York. Inside, at the piano, Mr. Richard Rogers. Behind him, Mr. Oscar Hammerstein. The tune, Oklahoma. Let's go and see them, shall we? Question three is, who was the interviewer? He's now very high up in the BBC. We move on now to animals on TV. Elephants may never forget, but viewers won't forget this elephant. And you'll notice that she hasn't got any tusks. And actually, in Ceylon, even the male uh, elephants don't have tusks. Oh, and, um, oh we're up with a slight penny down here. <laughs> <laughs> slight problem. Uh, get out of the way, I think. You're yes, supposed well. to be drinking it, Lulu. <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> it comes to all elephants, no doubt. Well, the interesting thing about uh, elephants, of course, is that trunk, this huge, great extra limb, which is really a nose and upper uh, lip. If I give her a, a bit of bun there, you see, how she uh, works with it, it helps to uh, feed her. And of course, uh, out in Ceylon, they, they use it uh, as a sort of tool almost. Yes, well, we'll be looking for oh, working oh, elephants oh. when we're out in Ceylon. And uh, they use these great trunks to carry wood around in the jungles. They even work on building sites. Who knows, we might see some working yeah, there. Never yeah. have. Yeah. Alec, thank you very much indeed. Can you? <laughs> yes, I'll take <laughs> a bite. Well, I think we're going to see Oh, she wants to All sorts of very exciting new and different yeah. things when we're in the salon. <laughs> Here she oh, comes. Yeah, yeah, the moment, she doesn't want to leave it. Hello. Here. Yeah. Oh, Off you go. Bye-bye, Lulu. Ah, what I was saying, we'll see all sorts of very yeah. exciting things. Yeah. <laughs> Not I should go that way. Not I should it. go that way. I should leave her here yeah, to have a drink, Alan. She's all right. be all right, yeah. Uh, but one thing we no. must do, one very important thing before we leave, and that is to make sure that our animals are going to be as happy as and we're yeah. obviously going to Not be when me. we're on holiday. Oh, get off me foot! No. <laughs> oh, thanks very much. <laughs> Well, our animals aren't going to be happy, in fact, because they're going away on holiday too. They're going to spend it out in the country, but Lulu won't be there. <laughs> Porky has never been the same since. The programme was, of course, Blue Peter, and question four is, who were those three presenters? Answers on a postcard by Thursday, please, to Did You See Quiz, BBC Television Centre, Wood Lane, London W12 HQT. The winner will receive £10 worth of licence stamps, the paperback of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and an LP and book of Not the Nine O'Clock News. Now for the answers to last Saturday's quiz. The actor who played the managing director in the first series of The Brothers was Glyn Owen. Jennifer Kingsley was on the board because she'd been the mistress of old Robert Hammond, who'd left her shares in his will, and Bill Riley eventually joined the board of directors too. 
In The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin, Mrs Perrin was played by Pauline Yates. The firm was called Sunshine Desserts, and the company which Reggie later founded was called Grot. The winner was John Davison of Witten, Middlesex. Congratulations. One of the most fascinating documentary series on television at the moment is... All Star Strange. Plaster Cast. Today's Blue Peter takes Peter Duncan to North Wales to help build the course for the hazardous canoeing race, the Wild Water Championships. And he gets a chance to shoot the rapids himself when he takes a test run down the course. When you can see whether he made it to the end or not, in Blue Peter at five past five. Now on BBC One, the return of an old cartoon favourite in a new series. Welcome to the opening of our new Ski Sunday series. And this first program comes to you from the Italian Alps. Well, throughout the winter months, we'll be traveling with the vast army of skiers, men and girls, trainers, coaches, backup team. Tonight, the editor of The Times on a crusade to save his paper. Sir Harold Wilson predicts Mrs. Thatcher's future. Yeah, it's quite clear to me the Tory party will get rid of her in about three years' time, and she'll then be in Tory mythology. Before the next election? Oh, very likely. If, if they decide they're going to lose the next election with her there, she'll be ditched, and she'll, uh, it will be as though she's never been. She'll become a non-person. They're a very, very cruel party. Good evening, Sir Harold Wilson taking a rather pessimistic view of Mrs Thatcher's future. We'll have that interview with Sir Harold later on in this programme. But one person who certainly is getting his marching orders is the editor of The Times, William Rees Mogg. By next March, The Times, our top newspaper for almost oh, 200 years, is going to cease publication unless somebody can be found to buy it. Within the next few days, literally, Rees Mogg and 4,000 other staff at Times newspapers are going to be told that their jobs end on March the 15th, the Ides of March. It's the result of the decision of Lord Thompson to sell his license to lose money, the Times newspaper group, which was for so long supported by his father, Roy Thompson. After losing 70 million pounds, attributed to unofficial stoppages, to overmanning, to the refusal to adopt new technology, Kenneth Thompson has had enough. If no buyer can be found and the bids have to be in by the end of the year, the Times and the Sunday Times will be closed down. Well, with this threat ahead of him, the editor of the Times has embarked on a plan to save his paper. After years of telling other people how to manage their affairs, he hopes to lead his own staff in a new and, for Fleet Street, a revolutionary concept, a journalist consortium to take over the Times. Elwyn Parry Jones has followed the first stage of the editor's campaign. You have chosen us to be the living... This is of English apple again. Well, I'll tell you what, Gail, I'm prepared to fight any ten people in the place who want to uh, <laughs> take me on before I get yeah, to this yeah. mackerel. It looks really super. Well, we've just been working out the price as well, and without all the little bits and pieces of garnish, it comes to about £1.50. With the garnish and the bits of apple and the watercress, it'll be about £1.80 to £2. Well, it couldn't be more cheerful. It could hardly be more cheap. Gail Dalf, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Harriet. <laughs> 1981 is only four weeks away, and already Britain looks as if it's starting off on the wrong foot. 1981 is the International Year of Disabled People, with its main aim, the integration of the disabled into everyday society. And yet, this week, the government announced plans to change the law on the education of handicapped children, which, far from supporting this aim, will, it's feared, perpetuate their inequalities and segregation. 
Well, there are well over a quarter of a million physically handicapped adults in Britain and 50,000 handicapped children. But there are still many people who have little understanding of their problems, often feeling ill at ease and embarrassed in their presence. So to those concerned with such children, the government's decision not to integrate handicapped children into ordinary schools is a backward step. Well, with me is Freddie Bloom, the former chairman of the National Deaf Children's Society and author of Care to Help, a well-written guide to understanding all handicapped people. Freddie, before... Indeed. Donny. In the cold, black deeps of intergalactic space, there's a keen sense of anticipation as that mysterious Time Lord we Earthlings know as Doctor Who prepares to change his external form once more. Well, before we meet uh, Peter Davison and discuss some possible alternatives, let's remind ourselves of the Doctor's earlier incarnations with the true original William Hartnell and Toby.